Good morning. Welcome to our Music for Brain Health webinar. Over 200 delegates from Canada, America, India, Taiwan, Spain, Malta, and all over the British Isles. Um, that's music. And I thank Katie, much loved BBC broadcaster, Art for Dementia patron, violinist, dancer, with kindly chairing uh, the discussion today. There are 200,000 new cases of dementia in the UK each year, as yet incurable, a terrifying prospect. But symptoms can be eased, and if people engage in weekly music and other well-being activity to nurture their resilience in the community. So today's webinar is focusing on how music making helps to relieve the isolating fears people feel in the period leading to diagnosis of a potential dementia. To encourage GPs to refer patients at the outset of symptoms through their social prescribing link workers to local musical opportunities to empower them to protect against cognitive decline, loneliness, depression and strain, enhance mood, self-expression and preserve confidence and as we all feel today bring a joyful sense of camaraderie and accomplishment. Could, could, could you all go on mute because we're getting all sorts of extraneous sounds. Thank you. Yes, that is the challenge of playing, learning music together, heightens brain activity and becomes a joy. Singing in a choir, musical theatre, opera group, playing an instrument, listening, imp improvising, learning music, learning new music, performing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> engages the whole me whole brain. As we age, it provides a tool for a total brain, brain workout. We warmly welcome our speakers, Dr. Iban Tripiana Sanchez, a clinical neuropsychologist from Spain with a special interest in how music helps the challenges of mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Bogdan Chivajoga, clinical and global lead for the National Academy for Social Prescribing and founder of NHS England's Social Prescribing Student Champion Scheme. Phil Hallett will present the wide range of genre offered through the Coda Music Trust in Hampshire. Grace Meadows, Director of Music for Dementia, offers music earlier in the life course. Victoria Hume will explain how musicians can raise awareness of your programmes through the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance's Regional Champion Network. And Sean Brand, Regional Champion and Learning Coordinator for the Social Prescribing Network in the East, uh, will show how link workers can help spread the word to patients. Before handing over to Katie, may I introduce you is, uh, to Muir Gray, um, director of the Optimal Aging Programme at Oxford, author of Increase Your Brain Ability and Reduce Your Risk of Dementia, and key advisor to our Arts for Brain, Arts for Brain Health webinars. Muir, hello. Hello. To, I just say two short things by way of introduction. Firstly, I'm going to speak a little bit about digital, and obviously we should get people face to face. But we're looking at different ways in which we can use the power of digital. We can stream concerts to care homes, and Maki Sakai is here has done that. Even more important, I think, is we can connect people. So there's probably 1,382 people love Verdi in care homes, but that's one every six care homes. But could we bring them together? The answer, yes. And it didn't be Verdi, it could be bagpipes or Scottish country dance music or something like that. And the third digital initiative that's taking place is that GPs will be able to prescribe music. Uh, we've got now the GP information systems able to do social prescribing. The other thing I'd say is that if you want to reduce your risk of dementia, the most important thing you can do is to get involved in setting up a charity to promote music or to help young musicians. It's interaction and challenges with others. That's probably the single most important thing you can do. And the tougher, Veronica, the tougher the job, the better it is for you. So I look forward to today's program very much and be thinking about ways in which we can make this real in every care home, in every person who's isolated at their own home, 
and how we can build it into music therapy linked to every drug therapy. So over to the, the, the key speakers, Ver Veronica. Thank you very much, Muir. And um, may I hand well, over to Katie? Um, very interesting about the linking up with um, with care homes, but and we're really focusing too on, uh, especially on helping people in that period before. Um, but um, we'll have a discussion on the care homes and, and um, digital um, towards the end, if we may. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. May I? Ha it's our great privilege to, to have you as as chair. And may I hand over to you now? Thank you so much for coming. Veronica, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, you know how uh, committed I am to supporting your wonderful organisation and how important this whole area of research is to me personally. Uh, such a pleasure to be here and for so many of you to be joining as well. I mean, this is something that I've, as I say, been, been very passionate about for a long time. And, and I've got the, the delight at the moment to be uh, presenting a, a podcast, which I hope you all listen to, called Just the Tonic, which is really focusing on the transformative power of music and the arts. I think what we all have in common on this panel is a fervent belief that music and the arts can transform people's physical and mental health. And what I hope we get from the next hour or so is a sense of what programmes are out there, how they work, how more people can access them, and how we can campaign at policy level for music to be made more central to our lives at every stage. We have this eminent panel, Veronica has already introduced them, of course, and I'd uh, like to ask them all to talk for about five minutes or so each, so that then we all have a chance at the end of this uh, hour to get involved, have a discussion, and for me to be able to take questions from you all as well who are listening to this webinar. So um, first though, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Sanchez, the uh, clinical uh, neuropsychologist from Spain, which uh, we already heard about from, um, from Veronica. But Dr. Sanchez, if you can just sort of set the scene for us, if you like, Dr. Veronica, uh, why music is so good for the brain. Uh, my English is, is not very, very good, excuse me for this. Well, um, music, uh, there are studies that, that, that support that music uh, improved uh, memory in general. No? Uh, there are studies that, that say that music improves uh, verbal memory in, subject, in health subjects and in people with dementia, uh, the music improves uh, working memory and attention, and musical memory prevails uh, over other same types of memory in, in a same disease. Uh, practic, uh, active musical practice uh, improves uh, cognitive performance in general. In our group of research, uh, we are working in this, and increase uh, active musical practice, uh, increase uh, cognitive reserve. And if the cognitive reserve uh, are increased, uh, it's less probably that, that one diagnostic of, of Alzheimer or, or another uh, dementia. No? Um, music uh, in dimensional behavior, uh, re reduce uh, disruptive and, and aggressive behaviors and anxiety in, in Alzheimer's disease. Music uh, is an important source of social and, in, and interactional uh, cohesion, increases uh, participation and empowerment in, in people with, with, with dementia. Uh, life music reduces uh, apathy in people with dementia too and uh, one of the, the effects of music in, in the brain uh, are increased dopamine in brain and the, the pleasure sensations, active uh, endogenous opiate peptides Reduces the music reduces uh, stress and protects against disease. Modulates uh, pain to music in the brain. Reduce uh, levels of, of beta endorphins of, of cortisol, biomarkers of, of, of anxiety. And um, one important 
think of music for me in, in, in the media is that music uh, is strange the immune system one one of the probably causes of 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 alzheimer's or another types of dementia is uh, is a cause uh, by by infection herpes virus is related to to dementia uh, bacteria and, and gingivitis infection in the mouth like gingivitis uh, related to to dementia too and uh, strength the immune system by the music is very very important for me uh, studies uh, uh, provide evidence that uh, music increase uh, activity of NK cells increase uh, the total number of lymphocytes uh, T cells CD4 and it's is very important. Uh, music modulating immune uh, system. Well, uh, music increased, increased uh, social participation and increased empathy is important. Music uh, increased oxytocin levels too. John, thank you very much indeed. You say that's all you had to say, but my goodness, that was more than enough because that sort of evidence that you are sharing with us is so powerful for us to be able to spread this message of how important music really is in a practical sense to help people with all sorts of health conditions. Now, I just wanted to invite Bogodan, please, to speak next because Bogodan, you're working so much with other doctors. You, I know how passionately you feel that this needs to, this sort of knowledge about the importance of music and the arts on brain health has to be integral to training in the medical profession. So please, over to you. Thank you so much, Katie, and a pleasure to, to see you all. And thank you for the warm um, welcome. And it's, it's lovely to see so many familiar faces from the past, but also many people from around the, the world joining in. Thank you, Iban, for that fantastic uh, point around the evidence and the benefits to, for, for music. And as you, as Katie rightly said, you know, you, you only said you, you have this little, but actually you contributed hugely and enormously. Now, let me just ask you um, uh, to imagine something. When I say the word health or healthcare, what do you think of? What do you imagine? Just portray that for a second without me putting any pictures, any slides in there. And we're already in a group where I'm sure you'll be thinking of, about much more. But your mind does, without you wanting to do so, wonder and go around and think about scrubs, stethoscopes, blood tests, x-rays, imaging scans, blood pressure cuffs, pills. Well, that's what young students go into healthcare for, right? Stitching, suturing, surgery, illness. And you're not wrong to imagine all of those things. It's the way that medicine has been really portrayed for decades using battleground terminology of fighting illness. We've more or less been taught to deliver a sick care model, one that pays doctors like me within the emergency department to fix and repair what's broken. But how wrong is that? How wrong is it that we don't put a price on preventing disease, on teaching our young trainees and students to improve brain health in the long run? We seek a formal diagnosis constantly, clinging to it with our teeth, and don't go ahead until we've put a label on an individual when we could have actually helped them live well in the long run, regardless of the diagnosis and label. The revolving door and fixed shop mentality we've built over the years only allows us to focus on only one third of the total population at a given time, those who are already sick. Think about that for a second. There's two thirds of us currently healthy, but we don't get to think about health until we become ill. And so when we do get ill, we seek it in formal institutions where the so-called experts are waiting to save the day. And so how have we allowed that to happen? Because year after year, we've taught healthcare students in an algorithmic fashion, in a constant battle against disease. If X, then Y. 
So what we were really doing was offering tomorrow's healthcare professionals a tunneled vision, a one-dimensional definition, a biomedical approach to health, a definition that sadly doesn't reflect the reality that we live in, a reality defined in proportion of 80% of our social determinants of health, our housing, our income, our education, our access to certain activities. So with people living longer, a rising long-term chronic diseases and the dramatic increase in dementia by 2050, as flagged by a recent Lancet paper, we have to change the definition of health once and for all. Brain health doesn't have to start within the hospital environment. Brain health starts within our homes and at the heart of our local communities with activities such as music, like Iban said. And for the future generation of healthcare professionals, they need to understand that too. So first and foremost, healthcare professional training must include music on prescription. Through organizations such as Arts for Dementia, Music for Dementia, students from across the UK have already started to understand that medicine is far from just being biomedical in nature. They clearly caught me in time and, and look how that's turned out. Um, secondly, early referral and accessibility to brain health activities such as music within the community is crucial. But you see, there's one important word I've just mentioned in there accessibility. Music shouldn't only be accessible to some, it should be accessible to all, it should be everyone's basic human right. But for that to happen, we need to make sure we tackle health inequalities and ensure we don't leave anyone behind, because it's easy for us to keep engaging with the people who are self-motivated and self-empowered to seek such activities. But what about the ones who don't have the opportunity to learn about or experience the benefits of music? And of course, it goes without saying, support of voluntary care sector organizations is crucial. Ensuring adequate funding for such activities to take place, activities that we know will result in healthier individuals and therefore healthier communities in the long run. Now, I know you already know all of this. I know you're part of the already converted group. You're already here. So you may be wondering, what can we all do to change the definition of health once and for all? Well, you see, I believe whether we like it or not, and hopefully we do like it, we are role models for those around us, be it in our own families as individuals, be it within the clinical environment as mentors, be it within the academic world, or even within the workplace as colleagues. So through each of our spheres of influence, we can play a role in reshaping values and beliefs, both amongst the current, but also the future generation. And I just don't talk just about clinicians. I talk about everyone's perspective and definition of health. As for me, I think my promise to myself and to you is that I'll continue campaigning for social prescribing and access to healthy community activities until tomorrow's healthcare professionals see social prescribing and music interventions as exciting as the most expensive immunotherapy drug or the most complex brain surgery um, you can imagine. And when that happens, when we see all, all that social and psychological uh, as important as biomedical, we'll get to experience the full benefits uh, of, of community health and prevention. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, speaking to you all later. Bogdan. I'd like you to be everybody's doctor, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's very, very inspirational. And uh, I'm sure you'll be getting questions later on as well. Let's turn now to a couple of examples of extremely successful programs putting this work into action. I'd like to introduce you to Phil Hallett from, uh, from CODA. He's been working in arts education for many moons. He's a champion, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and I'd love to hear more, Phil, from you now about what CODA is doing down in Dorset, as well as all the other work you're up to as well. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, uh, uh, yes, I'm calling from Dorset, um, from a charity called Coda Music Trust that is actively engaged in delivering the kinds of services and activities that we've been talking about so far this morning. And, and I think we're creating a little bubble of, of wonder down here. I've been here about 10 years now, and, and, um, and it's, it's lovely, I think, what we're doing to see how people are responding. Um, we do sit on the border of Dorset and the New Forest in a beautiful part of the world and our local population is significantly older than other places in the UK. Um, I think at one point Christchurch had the most elderly population in Europe um, and as a small community based organisation it was quite natural for us to begin to meet the needs and demands of our local population. And over time, word has spread and our staff and users have seen the potential for doing more. Uh, at the moment, 
We work with around 200 people in their 60s and older every week. Um, although we do work with people of all ages and abilities, but what I'm focusing on there today is this group of people. Um, and we provide a whole range of social ensembles and bands and courses and classes that occupy a space kind of in the sweet spot between learning and well-being. They meet both those objectives. Uh, ten years ago, I think we had one choir here at CODA. Now our choirs are joined by ukulele bands, jazz bands, folk bands, and a whole range of beginner and intermediate courses and classes that enable progression to and from these groups. Um, Although we have a significant arts and health program at CODA, which includes a clinical music therapy service um, and projects that use music to specific health issues, such as Parkinson's and stroke and dementia, the lure for people coming to the bands and groups that I'm talking about here was first and foremost to learn to play music in a band with other people. However, over the past decade, as general awareness has grown to how music can play a vital part in keeping physically and mentally active and supporting health and well-being in older age, we've seen this area work grow as a motivation for working with us. People now come because they know playing music is good for them, sure and simple as that. The groups that we run are pretty much financially sustainable and I think that's an important element for us to look at in this whole kind of mix, especially as the social prescribing structures are emerging in the UK. Um, we typically charge a small fee for attending, maybe five pounds, six pounds or seven pounds, which multiplied by the numbers in the group helps to pay for our professional music leader and other on top costs. Where necessary, sometimes there's a combination of a small fee and subsidies or donations or grants, which are fundraised by CODA as a charity, either specifically for courses or classes or more generally as a charity. But on the whole, we're, we're creating a sustainable kind of range of activities and services here. There's no formal evaluation around the impact with these groups just a myriad of anecdotal evidence and testimony from those attending about how it's helped with a recent bereavement or how it's kept people positive and connected throughout the pandemic or how their confidence has grown having performed publicly for the first time. All of these though are kind of key indicators when you start looking at, at well-being uh, um, surveys and results. I know that probably to truly connect with the formal health and social care services, more evaluation is probably a requirement, but I think what we're trying to create here is a, is a model where there's a blended way forward, where music on prescription, perhaps led by a clinical music therapy team and playing in a band are acknowledged as points on a scale of progress in the path to improving or maintaining well-being. In the past few years, I've certainly seen the culture change on the ground with both our users and with the health and social care systems. Certainly a move towards um, more holistic understanding of health that includes well-being and non-medical interventions. Some acceptance by people themselves of their role in their own health and an acceptance of how art and arts organisations can play a vital part in this bigger picture. I remember when I first got here, we would deliver to GP surgeries our flyers around singing for health sessions and people were confused as to why we were doing such a thing and uh, not accept those flyers. They were wondering what that, what that was. And similarly, more seriously maybe, we would um, fall down when trying to uh, get mental health patients referred for music therapy by social adult social care departments. But this is changing now and instead I see excitement on the faces of local social prescribers when I describe the whole range of opportunities that are offered by CODA and our cultural partners locally. There are lots of challenges, I think in particular how we work together with such different cultures of practice. Um, also maybe whether these solutions that we're offering can be accepted by those who are so used to medical intervention themselves. Um, and even whether charities like CODA can survive to play their role in this system as funds become scarcer and need greater. 
But for now, um, I know almost 25 mostly older gentlemen will invade Coda, sh Coda shortly for their Rusty Rockers session, which is a kind of musical men's shed for those who know that initiative. They come to achieve their dream of playing in a rock band, but in the process they make new friends and find support for their shared concerns. They're challenged and stimulated mentally to learn and play their favourite songs and physically to get and keep their fingers and toes moving. They may never tour the world, but they may still be dancing like Mick Jagger and the Stones well into their 70s and 80s. And that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? It most certainly does. I mean, I've now got that image in my mind of what uh, what your morning is going to be like after this webinar, Phil. <laughs> and it's noisy and it's full of joy. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, can I turn now to Grace at uh, uh, Music for Dementia to just explain a little bit about the powerful work that you've been doing there, Grace? And also, I know that you're aiming to uh, work with the DCMS and, and change policy, so it'd be really interesting to hear that angle as well. Lovely. Thank you, Katie. And thanks to everybody. I mean, it's been a very inspiring already this morning and there's more to come. And I know that we are, as Bogdan mentioned, talking to the converted. But um, for those of you who aren't aware, Music for Dementia is a national campaign calling for music to be an integral part of dementia care for all the reasons that we've just been hearing about. But actually, what we've found is that we've been living through one of the most complex uh, challenges in our lifetimes um, with the pandemic and we are faced with extraordinary challenges now that are acute, that are complex, that are cross-sector, that require a joined up, collaborative, cohesive, cooperative approach to how we uh, uh, approach them, how we recover, re how we re rehabilitate. And whilst music is not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea for everything, what we have learned and what we know and what the evidence shows us is that music is incredibly powerful to support health and well-being. And what we are, are, have been doing um, since April last year is working with the UK music industry. UK music, the umbrella body representing the uh, music industry in the UK to say, look, what more can we do if we join up and take a genuine cross sectoral sectorial approach? So elevating the original mission of the Music for Dementia campaign, which was trying to bring people together around the power of music for one particular group. We're now saying what happens if we put music into life across the lifespan so I am naturally biased as a music therapist and as a musician and someone who's worked in the NHS in special educational needs end of life I've worked with mums to be right through to people in the last moments of life I can see very naturally how music is the soundtrack to our lives and what we are saying is let's make music an integral part of our lives and I think that Bogdan you said something really important about accessibility and I think that chimes in very nicely with what we've always said at the campaign is that it's about the right music at the right time delivered in the right way by the right person it's that individualized personalized approach and you can take that if you have the right national and local services in place and that's what we're calling for with this work that we've been doing with UK music We've done a series of uh, workshops. We're currently in the process of writing a report and presenting that to the DCMS, to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, Department of Health and Social Care and Department for Education, because we understand that we need to do this together if we're going to create that culture and behavioural change and that different approach to music, taking it from being that nicety to that absolute necessity. I think it was Oliver Sacks, actually. I think I hijacked his phrase that he talked about in one of his books about music being a necessity for people living with dementia and, and we've always said that music isn't a nicety for people living with dementia it's a necessity but actually as we are all musical beings we all have the capacity to respond to music whether we believe that or not what regardless of what we think of our voices we all have an inherent ability to respond to music and therefore we have this capacity to have music as a health and well-being tool across our lifespan and what we've found through this consultation that we've been doing is that we are a nation of untapped musical potential we're not saying as phil's just love uh, brilliantly alluded to is you know we're not all going to be you know part of the rolling stones we're not all going to be nigel kennedy's we're not all going to be you know extraordinary musicians of that caliber but we can use music to enhance and 
uh, improve and enrich our well-being and our sense of self, our sense of contribution to the world, all of these soft skills that actually create meaning and purpose and give us drive and momentum and support our well-being. And in turn, all of that does feedback and support brain health, of course. So we will be presenting to government a very, very bold vision of how we put music into the lifespan. And brilliantly, we already have the support of the Secretary of State for, uh, for the DCMS, Nadine Dorries, who uh, we are talking to at the moment about these recommendations. We have the support of the music industry and the likes of Universal Music, which is incredible. We have the, the support of the Director for Personalised Care, James Sanderson, and others at the NHS and, and all of you on this call. And I think that's really important because I think Naturally, there are issues in the music and health space because of uh, uh, the impacts on resources. But what we're saying is, let's get behind this one mission, one vision. And in doing that, we can try and make sure that we have an ecosystem that works for all and that allows local services to flourish, but also allows national programs to happen. And they can work in partnership together. It might sound a bit utopian, but actually it's not if we get it right, if we get the structures in right, uh, structures in place properly, we can make this happen. We can make it so that somebody is growing up with music and that music is then a tool that they use for, a, you know, a, an autonomized tool, a self-agency tool to support their health and well-being. And I think then we're really getting into this idea of personalized care, what matters to the individual. So I think things like music on prescription is absolutely the heart of this, rec of this report and recommendations, because we need to shift that mentality around music being a nice thing to have. And it's an absolute necessity. And I think to Muir's point, it's this blended approach. We need that technological um, as aspect, but we also need to make sure there are in-person services. It's really about the right music at the right time in the right way. So. Our, our, our kind of campaign is absolutely about music and, and enabling people to be seen for who they are beyond their condition, whether that's dementia, whether that's a learning disability, autism, a mental health condition, whatever it might be. But it's about saying, let's make this integral to what it means to support health and well-being. And um, for anybody who wants any more information about that, obviously, please contact me. But I think that it's very encouraging to hear this kind of collaboration this morning because it absolutely personifies what it is that we're trying to, to, to shift in terms of culture and behaviour and system change. And I think now really is the moment to do that. We, The pandemic sadly has presented us with an opportunity to think about how we do this differently, how we recover and rehabilitate with music at the heart leading the way. Grace, thank you. And I will be fascinated to hear exactly how Nadine Doris's support actually manifests into policy change. I think we're all keeping our fingers crossed for that. Um, let us hear now from Victoria, because I think having talked about how important this is, let's talk about how we actually get it all out there. Uh, Victoria is Director of Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance and has, I think, what's the latest count? About 6,000 practitioners at your fingertips. Uh, Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, lucky us. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd like to repeat quite a lot of what Grace has just said, really, but I'm going to start by quoting um, the Arts for Dementia report last year, one of your super supporters, Andy Burnham, who said, I think care is helping people to do what they love, allowing them to connect with their passions and what animates them in life which I think hits the nail on the head for me. And like all of us, I'm gonna work from the assumption that we all believe that giving people access to creativity at moments of crisis is an essential expression of care. What we're really interested in at the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance is how we can make sure that that becomes not the exception, but the rule. Um, it's important to say that as Phil just illustrated, social prescribing is just one mechanism for helping health services connect with creativity. There are tens of thousands of people already delivering this kind of work around the country, in hospitals and clinics, in many different community settings. As an organisation, as you've just said, we've got 6,000 members, most of whom are the practitioners who are driving this work forward. And it's really dominated by freelancers, small arts organisations, many museums are engaged in this kind of work. Um, we put out reports in 2020 and 2021 that highlighted just a hundred of these arts organisations who were reaching people, shielding at home or stuck in institutions during the lockdowns, finding ways to support mental and physical health, despite all the obstacles in all of our ways. 
But social prescribing at this moment, with the government backing that it currently has, has the potential to be a really important mechanism to take this further. Um, going back to your report again, um, Prof Martin Marshall, who's the chair of the Royal College of GPs, says that the shift for us in general practice is not just engaging with medical activities, but engaging with social activities and making sure the two are aligned. Uh, so this is a logistical problem, but it's also a cultural one. It represents a huge culture change in primary care, in social care, in public health, but also in the cultural sector, which is beginning to sort of move toward a, a better understanding of how we can work in a collaborative way. Um, at the Alliance, we work with, as Veronica mentioned, a network of regional champions, a bit like the social prescribing network, to make sure that we understand the realities of this work on the ground and also sp spread uh, great practice. But one of the questions that we're trying to answer is how does a freelance musician or a music organisation actually get involved with social prescribing on a practical level? And there's no real answer to that question at the moment. A lot of very passionate and very determined people and organisations have found ways really by just knocking on every door they come across until someone lets them in. But it's quite a tiring process. It's a bit arbitrary. It tends to be very dependent on individuals' energies and connections. And GPs and link workers might want to prescribe into arts programmes. Arts organisations might want to be supporting people's health. But and there are some amazing examples dotted around the country, as we've just been hearing. But what we don't have is a consistent and efficient system for making that happen. Uh, the real answer to this, I think, not very romantically, but echoing what Grace said about having the right mechanisms in place is proper investment. <clears throat> and the government has committed a certain amount of money to the link worker program, arguably not nearly enough, but almost no funding for people who are actually providing the prescriptions. So your report highlights the Thriving Communities Fund, which is an exception. And it's also a great model for bringing together collaborators across health and across a range of specialist community organisations, not just the arts, but people providing access to nature, supporting exercise, supporting um, help around finances. And it's really good to know that there's some potential for that programme to be ex extended. What I hope it will do is catalyse investment into giving these kind of cross-sector collaborations a long-term future, not just this kind of project-based approach that we seem to be stuck in at the moment. We know from our surveys at the Alliance that the vast bulk of creative work supporting health is funded through project grants from charitable trusts and foundations. So we have this kind of precarious project-based system trying to meet a big statutory system. And what we really need is investment into an infrastructure that can build the kind of alignment that Martin Marshall is talking about. There are some real beacons out there taking a strategic approach to this work. So in Gloucestershire, the Clinical Commissioning Group has been investing in arts on referral for two decades now, and that, that um, longevity of investment has led to significant falls in GP consultation rates and hospital admissions. In 2020, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and again, it goes back to Andy Burnham and the way that, that the city is operating, um, launched a publication called A Social Glue, which aligns culture with Manchester's commitments to health equity as the UK's first Marmot City region. In Cornwall, in the Isles of Scilly, the council's um, culture and public health teams have developed, have come together to develop a creative health and wellbeing partnership. And that's particularly focused on addressing health inequalities, improving mental wellbeing, addressing loneliness and isolation. And for me, it's this kind of place-based partnership work that can respond to local priorities and it can provide a network for creative practitioners in this area to be able to find that way into health that can be so elusive at the moment. It's this kind of joined up thinking, and again, Grace referred to an ecosystem, which is a really helpful word that will give us the chance to spread the work that we all know should be happening everywhere. Music is really like all creativity offers this chance to transform the story for and the experience for individuals and their families at moments of deep crisis and change. But it can't be about one off miraculous events anymore. This is about how we can make miraculous into the everyday. Victoria, thank you so much. Um, and I think it's ideal now that we've got Sean Brand here to talk from the perspective of being part of one of those networks and to just to discuss a little bit about the challenges faced, just trying to make it all pull together and actually working with the practitioners. Thank you, Katie, and uh, thank you so much, Victoria, and all of the other previous speakers. I am just so totally inspired and I've been in social prescribing for a number of years now. Um, 
probably almost seven years from when the network started, the national network. Um, and we've seen moving from a social movement of social prescribing to national policy in probably the quickest turnaround I've ever seen um, happen for the NHS in terms of commissioning something. So um, where does social prescribing sit? So it sits, um, it came around formally within the long-term plan, which is now three years old. And the funding for the link work has actually has, has been in place now for two and a half years. So we're still relatively new in terms of national policy. But since that point, we've actually grown um, the workforce of social prescribing link workers to in excess of 1500 across England. And obviously that did, doesn't include what we have um, around the United Kingdom um, and indeed across the world, because we know from Bogdan around the, the global alliance that's now <coughs> emerging as well. So as Grace has mentioned, it's, it's very much within the personalised care strategy. So um, you may have heard the saying, um, it, it's about what matters to you rather than what's the matter with you. So we're changing that conversation we have with people that we're talking to in the NHS um, and really focusing on people's strengths and their assets, their history, what makes them them. And music is absolutely a key part of this. So these link workers um, generally are based around GP practices. Many are hosted actually by voluntary sector organisations, um, but they serve a practice based population. So anybody um, with a social need should be able to access um, a link worker um, at an appropriate point that where they need it. And obviously never more so than during the pandemic have we seen the need for social prescribing link workers and that shift to supporting people in, in their social needs. Um, and music, absolutely, as we've heard from the evidence, and it's wonderful to have that evidence, plays a key role in health and well-being um, generally. So that biopsychosocial model. Um, and the link workers play a key role in knowing what's in the community. And that comes as a, a generic part of their, their role um, as link workers, but also the need has been mentioned by others, particularly um, Phil and Grace around connecting and knowing what's happening in their communities. And it will be different even across the county um, as to what's available, when, where and to whom. Um, so I, in my roles as learning coordinator and regional facilitator, support the link workers directly very practically around their learning and development. So I'm opening their eyes and I'll absolutely be sharing this webinar with all of my link workers in the East and the national team as well. Um, but also I support systems. So we have emerging integrated care systems and these will be the strategic leaders in regions that will be deciding how their money is spent. And so I will be placing in front of them things like this that say, look, look at the evidence, look at what Phil's doing, um, look at how Grace is, is reporting um, different schemes and look at Victoria's reports. What are we doing? How are we spending our money? And I, uh, we will work very closely with the National Academy of Social Prescribing and the regional leads around thriving communities. So what's really challenging for those link workers at the moment um, is the fact obviously they're working in a pandemic. Um, they are have very, very he heavy caseloads. So if organisations or musicians suddenly pass their information to individual link workers, it's very difficult to get that grit around building relationships because they are so stretched. Um, even though the ambition of NHS England is to grow teams of link workers within primary care networks and GP practices, we're not quite there yet. So the easiest way is probably to connect with your regional facilitator or learning coordinator and link with the National Academy of Social Prescribing Thriving Communities Lead for your region as well. That way we can build a, a, a sort of mini distribution of knowing what's available for music in a set area and share that in a much more accessible way for the link workers to get hold of that information. We hold peer support sessions and many of the areas actually like to have speakers come along and tell them what's going on. So there's some really practical ways that we can help you connect. Um, and I hope you take that opportunity to, to link with those appropriate people. So um, my job after today is to spread the message about this wonderful webinar and the Q&A that's just about to happen. Um, to the link workers in my region. I'll definitely do it with my other learning coordinators across um, indeed the country and also the national um, team as well. So 
thank you for your time today and um, back to you Katie. Sean, thank you. You set that up beautifully because, yes, time for Q&A. We've got uh, 12, 15 minutes if we uh, push it a little bit. 12, but certainly a, a good chunk of time to get some questions from you who've been watching uh, the webinar because I think a lot, of, a lot of interesting points have been raised. And one which sort of strikes me initially is with the amount of evidence that we've got between us here in this group, how much more convincing does the government need? quite frankly. This is what strikes me every time I have these conversations with people who work with the music and, uh, and, and brain health and, and health generally. So um, I don't know if somebody would like to just sort of get the ball rolling with that. And I see a hand from Muir. Muir, do you want to take that on board? Yeah, well, I, I think the government's done enough, actually. Um, we can do a bit more. And I very much hope they get, they get Grace's report and do something about it. But I think we've got to go now, and it maybe we do. Uh, we, we have to plan an attack on the various royal colleges. You know, what is well, Charles Society of Physiotherapy? What's their policy on music, for example? Um, the Royal College of GP is probably on board, and I say we can relieve their work by doing it automatically through the GP information systems. But the British Geriatric Society or uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, so. I think now we've got to get down to the uh, the future of clinical practice and uh, advancing the report on over prescribing said it was the lack of social and active prescribing and possibilities it was one of the reasons for over prescribing so I think it's the professions we need to change the way they think as Bogdan was saying early on. Thank you, Muir. Now I'm waiting as I'm looking at the chat here to see any questions coming up from our audience. Um, but meanwhile, I mean, do any of you on the panel, I mean, Bogdan or Grace, if you've got your hand up, would you like to respond to Muir? Yes, I, I'd absolutely agree, agree with what Muir said. And we do need that, absolutely. But we also need a public campaign so that we start to understand the role of music in supporting health and well-being um, much more and and that people start to associate music with it being an absolute necessity and I think we can do that in a variety of fun and amazing ways just think about what the work Vicky McClure has done with our dementia choir I mean she has absolutely put front and center singing and music um, for, for people living with dementia as a synonymous thing you know you think about dementia and you think about Vicky and the choir and what she's doing and if we can do that over a period of three years, a really targeted, well thought out national campaign that has important landing points in it, we can start to help people make associations with music where they may not do that now, currently. And I think it's, it's really about speaking to need. It's about demonstrating how music can address needs. You know, we do this on a tiny micro level every day when a music therapist might be pitching for work, for example, they might be talking to an institution about how they can uh, use music to address the needs in that particular setting. But what we need to do is elevate that conversation, have it at a national level and say, how can music help us address our mental health crisis? How can it help us address isolation and loneliness? How can it help us support recovery and rehabilitation from the pandemic? How can it support dementia? We need to be taking it up to a huge level in terms of the messaging. It's a, it's a real communications piece, I think, as well as the kind of systematic uh, tactical stuff that needs to happen that sort of underpins and, and, and ensures that sustainability that, that Victoria is talking about. I think, I think your, your uh, point about it being a big national conversation is so important, Grace, but I know there are questions coming in as well, making the point that, of course, um, you know, there is a reduction in music in schools. And if we're not getting children accessing music at a young age, then we have got a bit of a problem at getting them to understand the importance of music for their health and well-being. So are you sensing at a policy level when you're dealing with the DCMS that they're talking to the Department of Health, uh, the Department of Education as well? Yes, that's part of what we're doing is we're trying to take a cross-departmental approach yeah. to this is, is to bring DCMS, Department for Education and the DHSC together because if we want to push that lifespan message then we have to have all of those departments working together. Now then, Veronica, you had your hand yes. up there. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to get back to what we're on about today, which is um, we need to bridge this gap for people um, 
as, as symptoms of a potential dementia come in. We need, we need GPs to know that, the, that, that they should refer them to music right at that early stage because they are living in fear and trauma and the great strain at home needs to be overcome. And also, although um, Arts for Dementia and Music for Dementia have dementia in their name, where possible, especially before a diagnosis, uh, when people are traumatized by the thought of having dementia, to refer to brain health the Global Brain Health um, Institute um, ha had an excellent po podcast by a person who um, was um, who had dementia, and she said, um, "I would much rather that I was told because dementia has demented that terrible adjective that people misuse." And um, she said, I'd much rather people said that told me that I had um, brain disease like heart disease. And it's a matter of tact. And so if we can try now and think of brain health, preserving brain health, always to be positive and empowering before and even actually after. I, we, we all need to have dementia in our um, charities titles because... Um, you know, people needed to know that music and arts and all of that really do help. But where possible, if we can change the language and refer to preserving brain health before and after um, diagnosis, even if our charities are called, <laughs> called dementia, it would make people feel much, much more un uh, less uncomfortable. And so we we need to. Um, but if we can also, we just need to bridge this gap, and we need to do so by. I'm hoping um, a campaign for an amendment to the NICE guideline, um, d dementia diagnosis guideline. They talk about social prescribing. They talk about um, arts for people, which was quite an achievement for dementia post-diagnosis. But now they need to make definitely sure that they keep people um, in in the community because if you're engaged in music. All that time when you're having you're having the memory assessment, which makes you feel that you've failed and probably failed in front of your son who has never felt sorry for you before, um, and you don't want anyone to feel sorry for you. Um, you really need to be engaged in these lovely musical activities. It'll keep. Obviously, we want music for the life course, which is fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, and arts for life course. It's terribly important. But we we need to make a concerted effort. That um, when people, when you, if you ever know of anybody with, um, you know, who has these things, instead of having people saying, "Oh, well, she's away with the fairies," and I'll talk to the husband or I'll talk to the wife, talk to them, get them engaged, and um, and I must admit, go to Coda because I mean, the range of music that you offer there, it's just phenomenal. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'll take my hand down. <laughs> Victoria, Victoria, what would you like to contribute? Just responding to Veronica, I think um, some of some of this is about building trust, right? I spoke about the fact that there's a culture change, and it. So, it, as a as a GP, how do you how do you get excited about referring somebody to a music program? A, if you don't know where there is one, and B, if you're not sure how exactly that's going to contribute to health. And so, I think there's there's sort of there's several aspects to it. There's exactly what Grace said I think the national conversation is definitely a big part of that and kind of an awareness raising program but there's also things that the, some of the anxiety that we hear expressed is around stuff like quality frameworks and how you how you assess as a clinical practitioner the quality of the work that you're prescribing people into I get very nervous about the word quality in relation to the arts because I associate it with a kind of high arts ideal which is not really what a lot of this work is about it's much more about process and involvement but at, at this moment NASP the National Academy for Social Prescribing and Spirit of 2012 are collaborating on a quality, new quality framework for social prescribing which I think is actually going to be really helpful for us because it takes the pressure off arts organizations to be determining that in a sort of at a distance from from clinical um imperatives but there's also a lot of it for me is about local partnerships and as you were just saying, Veronica, it's, it's experiencing this work that often converts people, if you like, to, to understanding the value of it. And if if we can get to a point where GP consortia and, and link workers are able to work more with artists who are in the same physical area as them, then I think you start to build trust and understanding and it becomes much more about relationships that have some sort of longevity and, and less about this kind of abstract idea of, of clinical over here and music over here. Is, is it a pipe dream to think that the, one of the most effective ways to get that trust and understanding from the health practitioners would be for them to experience it themselves? 
I wonder if there's some... I don't think it's a pipe dream at all. I think it's critical. And that's, you know, thank God for Bogdan and all the work that he's doing. But I think <laughs> that, you know, getting this work into clinical education is totally critical for me. I, if, if, if people, I, and I've seen this, if people have experienced some aspect of the arts during their education as clinicians mm. or as allied health professionals, that totally transforms the way they work. So I'm thinking, Bogdan, you need to set up several choirs in, amongst all junior doctors, yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. Just, just to echo Victoria's thoughts in there, Katie, as well, and just to say that it's not just um, doctors and it's broad healthcare professionals, but also our students themselves and working together with the medical students, with the nursing students, with the occupational therapy students, the physiotherapists uh, and the drama students together in, in a way in which they would appreciate health differently, once again, in a way in which we don't just fix broken things uh, in a way that we prevent and create health from the beginning and which i think is something we've neglected but we can't neglect anymore not because it, it would be just a nice thing to do but that by 2050 and what the pandemic is showing us now we have people living longer which is to be celebrated but there's an increase in chronic diseases we have more and more patients turning up and the quality in care is decreasing because we're just running around trying to fix things. Uh, and, and just to, to end on, on the note that there's a huge misconception amongst clinicians and amongst my colleagues thinking that uh, personalized care and, and social prescribing increases the, increases the workload and their time. And they think they don't have time to deliver that. And in fact, I've had comments made to me as a doctor in the emergency department that I don't have time to do certain activities or be nice to people or um, try to, uh, to look at the long-term problems. And that's wrong because I know deep down is an upfront investment of time that I'm making, and therefore it's gonna prevent them in the future from coming in and using the service again. Um, and so, Grace, I know you have your hand up, so I'll stop there as well. No, no, just I just very quickly wanted to elaborate on a point that you've just made about time. And when we were leading the music therapy and maternity project at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, this exact thing came up. We, When we first started working in maternity care, the midwives came to us and said, we're crying five times a day. We have women sitting in our waiting room for three hours for an oversubscribed clinic. They are screaming at us. They're stressed out. They're going in to see the consultants. They're not hearing or receiving their care as well as they could be because they're in a distressed state. They said, please come and help us. What can you do? So in we came, wheeling our keyboard through Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, sitting there for three hours every Tuesday morning playing in the antenatal clinic. We did a quick evaluation, very simple, and we found that the midwives stopped crying that they had a better patient staff relationship, that the patients had be a, be a better experience of care and the consultants said that they were able to deliver a better uh, level of care for everybody. And the, and the women felt that they went away having a better health care experience and then they thought about their health and well-being in a completely different way. What of that isn't a win-win situation? <laughs> and all it took was one person with a keyboard for three hours with clinical experience and training. And yes, there was an investment there in timing and trust. But actually, in seeing that, to your point, Katie, that you just made in terms of changing minds, actually having consultants and senior management from Chelsea and Westminster come and see that working process meant that that work was then fully supported and embedded in care. So <laughs> I do think people need to see, feel and hear it because when you've seen, heard and felt it, you can't undo those things. And then it means you're much more likely to put resource to it and commit to it. Well, as so often happens with these <laughs> webinars, just as the clock ticks down, there's this flurry of activity and agreement and ideas and conversation going on on the, <laughs> on the chat and so on. But um, we are approaching the end of our time. I think, Veronica, do you want to just round things up for us and say goodbye? Do we have time for that? I just want to say, to, well, thank uh, above all, Katie, thank you oh, so goodness. much. I'm sure your, your presence here probably brought in um, more people than we've ever had before. And thank you for your professionalism Absolute and pleasure. wondrous inspiration as music. And Muir, um, without you, we'd, well, actually with, with all of you, but Muir, you have guided these in the most marvellous way. And although in my experience, I haven't... Um, you know, being involved with care homes, I can see the absolute um, vital um, importance of being so. So we'll share everything that, that you have said. Um, I think a very important point that Sean has made is that we have always involved uh, medical, neuro well, not always, but in the last few years, involved medical and neuroscience students with art students and interacting with people experiencing cognitive challenges. Maybe we should find out, liaise with you to find out a bit about 
um, social care trainees too, but um, and and all get together. Uh, but thank you, Katie, and and gosh, um, the wonderful work that that um, policy change that everybody is engaged in. Um, this is so terribly important, and. Um, Thank you, thank you, 